So um, I'm glad to be here. Uh, I've never been on Twitter, and my only connection with Twitter is I've been told there's a hashtag, Lant Rant, um, which I may do a little bit of today, the ranting part. Uh, I believe with Keynes once said that words should be a little bit wild. So I'm going to say some things that many of you, most of you, disagree with, because I think uh, disagreement, uh, while never being disagreeable, uh, disagreeing is a productive source of progress. Uh, if we all just say the same thing, we might be caught into mindsets. Uh, I one time gave us, I was the respondent to a speech at the Smithsonian Institution. And uh, my mother, who is from Boise, Idaho, which is a kind of remote village in uh, America, uh, was there in Washington, DC. So she came along. And as I was speaking, the woman sitting next to my mother, who didn't know it was my mother, uh, turned to her and said, this speaker makes me so angry. And my mother, bless her heart, didn't say, I'm his mother, didn't defend me. She said, you know, I've known him for a long time, and he does that to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start with that. Um, so they're kinky is a word I'm going to explain exactly why I use this word. But let's start with a bet noir of kinky development, which is some kids at Harvard invented a soccer ball with a battery that is charged by motion, such that if you kick the soccer ball around, it can power a single LED light bulb for about three hours. Um, and then in 2003, uh, President Obama, who was uh, a busy and otherwise occupied man with lots of tasks, takes time out of a visit to Africa to kind of show off the soccer ball, right? to highlight this soccer ball as something, some addressing of the concerns of power in Africa. Um, now, this is the kind of thing that I think is completely beyond the pale ridiculous, in the sense that the reality is this is the view of America from space at night, and this is the view of Africa from space at night, which reveals to you the true magnitude of the lack of electrical power in Africa. This is a this continent, or this part of the continent, has as many people as that continent. And yet, the typical American uses 13,000 kilowatt hours of electrical power a year. The typical resident of Ethiopia, 52. The typical resident of Kenya, 155. The typical resident of Nigeria, 149. Orders of magnitude less power. Africa does not need soccer balls that if you kick them around and if they happen to work and if they happen to continue to function, and by the way, cost enormous amounts, cost nearly per capita GDP to buy each. Uh, they need power. They need large scale power, right? And they need it in massive, massive quantities that are going to require massive, massive investments. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the politics, uh, the precarious reality of development politics is that some parts of development, particularly the kinky parts, are very seductive and hence very popular. And other parts of development that really need to happen are easily blocked in rich country politics. So Senator Patrick Lay is a Democrat from Vermont. And the politics for the developing world was that he slipped into the Appropriations Act, which funds the US government, a, an instruction that the United States should oppose any loan grant strategy to support any large hydroelectric dam. So somehow the country that's consuming 13,000 kilowatt hours thinks it would be wrong as part of the development to build a large hydroelectric dam, in spite of the fact that on Senator Leahy's own, own website for his home state, 
he points out that Vermont has 64 operating hydroelectric plants. Uh, sorry, 84. <coughs> Not to mention of which, they also draw a large part of their energy from, and of course, <laughs> you notice the capacity of this is all out of scale with the capacity of anything that exists in Africa. And they draw a large part of the rest of their electrical power from Hydro-Quebec, which is this massive series of massive dams. So kind of what's good for us, which is to have reliable power in our houses every day, um, generated off large hydroelectric things, should be opposed as any part of a development project financed by the international financial institutions, which include, of course, the African Development Bank, the World Bank, and others. Um, why and how exactly do we reconcile this? And what I worry is that a large part of the reconciliation is oh, we'll come up with some cute, clever way of providing Africans all the power they need by kicking around soccer balls so that we can indulge ourselves in political fantasies we have about we're doing development while in fact denying people the exact development processes that we enjoy. So um, here's a real conversation that I had in India um, while I was working as a development practitioner for the World Bank and living in India, and I had been there for some time, and I was having a discussion with my colleagues about how to structure a water sector project in which we are going to invest literally hundreds of millions of dollars in developing water sources. And they had these ideas about the way in which to do this that were very project specific and very programmatic. That is, we'll create ways of doing water such that we have a project that does water. And I was thinking, no, 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 we need an organization that does water. <laughs> and after about an hour of conversation, I said, you know, I think the problem we're having is we're discussing the means without discussing the ends. We're discussing how to do water without discussing what's your vision of water. And so I said, what is your vision of what success will look like in the water provision, in sort of household water in India. And they said, oh, well, we have a very clear definition of success. It's the goal the Indian government has that every household in India should have be within half a kilometer, right? Half a kilometer is like, well, it's, a, it's exactly a half a kilometer away, right? That's a long ways to walk. Right? <laughs> should be within a half a kilometer of 40 liters a day of safe water. So in, the, in their vision, universally available standpipes, this is their vision of success in the water sector. And I said, I see exactly why we're disagreeing. This is my vis vision of success in the water sector in India, which is that everybody can take a hot shower inside their house. When we have been successful at development in India, everyone in the country will have this, or at least access to this, right? We're not stopping at this. This is terrific compared to what she might have had, but this is not my vision of success. This is a vision of kinky success. This is a vision of kinky development. This isn't yet done. So, <clears throat> um, and you might think, Many of the countries are many of the countries of the world um, that there's political momentum. The head of the USAID the other day sent an invitation for me to come to a meeting, premised on the fact that political momentum was building to make the end of extreme poverty central to the post 2015 agenda. Now you might think. <clears throat> Making eliminating extreme poverty defined as people living on less than a dollar a day, like who could be against that, <laughs> right? Me. I am dead set against that as being central to the development agenda. Meaning, I want extreme poverty to be eliminated, but I want extreme poverty to be eliminated by there having been development. Not defining development as the elimination of dollar-a-day poverty. 
because those lead to two very different conceptions of what development is and what development success would look like. Dollar, so dollar a day poverty is a complete fiction. It's made up. And I can assure you of this because I was there when it was made up. It's a complete social construct of world hyper elites. What do I mean by hyper elites? I mean the elites of the elites. <laughs> People who work at the World Bank are the elites of the elites, right? They're not like, <laughs> they're not even like the elites of their own country, right? And what they are pushing for is this. Whereas if you just look at the relationship between how people respond to satisfaction with their own well-being and their income based on surveys in country after country after country, what you find is nothing special happens at a dollar a day. There is no line at dollar a day. What would a line look like? Well, in some phenomena, there is a line, like water. <laughs> There's a really important line in water that we all know and understand. It's called zero degrees Celsius. Why? Because below zero degrees Celsius, water behaves in one way. It's hard. You can skate on it. If it falls on your head, it hurts. Above zero degrees Celsius, water behaves in a completely different way. So there's some dramatic transition in water between being a solid and being a liquid. There is nothing like that in the economic space. As people get more income, they get better off, all the way down and all the way up. <laughs> Meaning as we go from near dollar a day levels to better off, people get better off. As we go from $2 a day levels to, you know, and these aren't dollars a day, these are in thousands of dollars, and I'll fix this later. But basically, people get better off as they get richer, all the way up the spectrum. You can't look at these lines and say, oh, here is the level of income that's important for people to be better off. And here, kind of income stops mattering. It's all the way down, and it's all the way up. There is no line. <laughs> okay, so, but we have insisted on creating a line around dollar a day poverty that creates a kink. Somehow it's really important to get from below dollar a day to above dollar a day because there's a kink in our, how we feel about that. One is attacking poverty and one is leakage from poverty programs. That's complete rubbish. Complete rubbish. It's a social construct of hyper elites that just has no sense in reality. So now, let me summarize my three big messages, <laughs> which let me keep myself on time here. So <clears throat> first, there are three paths to improve normative measures of human development, which is what we're after as an objective with development. And I call them drive, shift, and kink. And of those three, drive matters far and away the most, first. Second, kinky development, like penurious poverty lines dollar a day, is enormously seductive to some political constituencies in the West. Nobody outside the West <laughs> pays any attention to this, except insofar as it's driven by the West. But it's in kinky development is becoming even more seductive um, in the West. Third, the danger, of, the danger of the seductiveness of kinky development is that it, become, it, it can become a fetish, that we can mistake kinky development for real development, and we can absorb our efforts into things that aren't, in fact, long-run productive. Because na old-fashioned national development is messy and hard, and countries have failed at it, but it's actually necessary for broad-based human development. <coughs> so I think the more development cooperation becomes focused on the kinky, the less successful it will be, and it will ultimately put its path itself on a path to internal destruction. So, <clears throat> so now I've got to step back and sort of illustrate those messages so that you know what I'm saying. So the first distinction I have to draw is between national development and human development. National development is a process that happens 
at a societal level, which could be the nation, could be a nation, could be a nation state, and national development. Um, uh, okay, and that, but human development is an aggregation of things that may or may not be done at the national development because ontologically at their level we start with the individual human well-being. So we could all start <coughs> with the education of each person in this room. And then we could disaggregate the education of each person in the room into the education of the blue-eyed and the brown-eyed or the education of the left-handed and the right-handed. Those wouldn't have any real consequence, but we could do it because it was built up from individuals, and we could also then create a measure of the average education of everybody who was Czech versus the average education of everybody who in the room who wasn't Czech. But that wasn't a necessary distinction, whereas national development isn't at the individual level, it is at an aggregate level. And this is, I'm using the word ontologically, and all I mean by ontologically is things don't change their ontological nature. So this has all of the elements of being a frog. Its frogginess is preserved through all these transformations, and development is a dynamic process that never changes its ontological nature. So national development happens at the level of a national in the deep way that sort of it becomes more of something, but it never changes its fundamental nature in the same way that human development never does. So national development is a fourfold process whereby the rule systems that accommodate, that make things possible at the national level get better. <laughs> so, and those things I'll call rule systems in part because I try as best I can to avoid the word institutions. And the reason I avoid the word institutions is that I have no clue what it means. And I guess is neither that you do, neither do you, but professors you read about think they do. And I just think that's false. So I think if I sent you off and said, go to the store and bring me back six institutions, you'd have no idea what to come back with, right? So rule systems are ways in which individuals cooperate in a given context. And rule systems can get better in the economy to make for higher productivity. Rule systems can get better in the polity so that the sovereign acts more in the interests of the underlying citizens. Rules can get better in organizations so that the organizations have higher capability because individuals cooperate in organizations, and rule systems can get better in the equality with which they treat each other. And those four transformations are what I call national development. Your nation is more developed if it has more of those four things. And we can quibble in a little while if we feel like it about how much of those things in which order and what sequence, but basically <coughs> countries like Czech Republic are developed countries because they have lots more of those things than countries like Mali. <clears throat> Human development, on the other hand, has a whole bunch of domains and a whole bunch of ways of adding this up, and I'm trying to avoid this, but everything you've ha heard about human development is consistent with everything I'm going to say. Meaning, I'm building an argument that encompasses everything you know. Right? So everything you know is a special case of what I'm saying. <laughs> and all I mean by that is all a human development indicator is is we pick some dimension of human well-being and then we think about how we normatively order that. A person is better off if they have more of this and this much better off if they have this much more of it. But the thing about <clears throat> human development indicators is since there's human beings, Within any given society, there's a distribution of well-being from low to high, right? And then we can think of various ways of summarizing this distribution. So say this was income, say this was level of, 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 of education, say this was access to water. Then we could say, we could say this distribution can be characterized in a number of ways. One, we could have a low bar characterization, which is how many people that this distribution represents are below the low par? So if this is access to water, how many of them don't have access to water? Or we could characterize it by its central tendency. Like the bulk of people have this access to water. Or we could characterize it by its inequality or some measure of its dispersion. There are lots of different ways of characterizing it. So every human development indicator <laughs> 
that you've ever seen or uh, heard about or thought about is a subset of what I'm, is a subset of this. Meaning it's, it's some domain and it's some way of summarizing that domain. And that's what every human development indicator is. And what I'm about to say is true of every human development indicator you've ever thought about. So, <clears throat> there are now three, so then if we think, let's take national development, which is this fourfold <coughs> definition of economy, polity, capability, and society. Then we can order countries, one per country. Each country has one level of national development. And then for all the people in that country, we can look at the distribution of human development. And again, we can take any domain you want. We can talk about human rights, we can talk about access to water, we can talk about anything, right? <clears throat> and then we want to say, say we've got this country's level of national development and this country and the people in this country's distribution of human development, how do we make them better off, right? Because these measures of human development are, are what I call normatively ordered. We actually want people to be better off in these dimensions. Okay? Now, there's three ways of thinking about how we make this distribution get better, where higher is better, right? One I call drive, which is <clears throat> if we look across countries in the world with higher levels of national development, there's a strong association between the distributions of human development and the levels of national development. So one way of making human development better off is just get more national development. Just drive east, <coughs> right? And by driving east, we'll push ourselves north. So that's drive. And it's, but the point is, is it's actually focused at this national level. Nobody's actually doing anything specific about human development. We're just doing things about making this better off. And the causative consequence of making this better off is to make that better off. So drive. We're just going to become better, better nation states. More productive economies, more responsive polities, more capable states, and more social equality. And, and I'm, <clears throat> the word social is so hard to use, but social equality is, is kind of people within the society are treated roughly equally independent of their conditions of birth is the rough definition. Okay, now the second way to get better off is to say, well, I'm not really going to drive east on this particular indicator of human development for which I've lost an access. That access should be, this axis should be labeled. <coughs> um, I'm just going to, I'm just going to move everybody north. So what could that mean? So, well, I'm not going to change the whole country, but I'm going to get better at education. And I can imagine I get better education in various ways. I can maybe spend more proportionally on education, and maybe that'll make everybody better. I can get better at doing education so that out of the same spend, I get more outcomes. But I'm thinking of it all shifting up uniformly. I'm not focused on the low end. I'm just making everybody better off by doing it better. right? So this would be what I call shift, and it moves the whole distribution up. This would be sort of sectoral approaches. I'm going to get the whole health sector working better. I'm going to get the whole education sector working better. I'm going to get the whole water sector working better. right? And that's going to benefit everybody. It's going to get more hot showers, and it's going to get more standpipes. Right? <clears throat> um, the third way of making things better is kink. And what do I mean by kink? What I mean by is we draw a low bar target, right, through the low end of the distribution, and then we focus on bringing everybody below that up to that level. So we set a poverty line. And we say 17% of the people are poor, and we want to reduce poverty. And how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to focus on the poor, and we're going to raise the incomes of the poor differentially. We're not going to pull the whole thing up. We're not going to drive east. We're just going to focus on those people. right? And that would shift this up. And the reason I call this kinky is that, let's say, your distribution of well-being was, was normally, in the Gaussian sense, distributed before and you are successful at pushing everybody to align, then your distribution after your successful intervention would look like this, right? Because we've pushed everybody who was low up to this line. And by doing so, we've induced a kink at the threshold. So this is what I mean by kinky development, is we're focused on a low bar threshold, 
And our only kind of objective is to get people up to that threshold. And if we were successful at that, we, we actually create kinks around this line, right? Everybody understand that? Okay. That's completely false. I really call it kinky because it's like all well, packed lecture houses. I'm sure if I had called it, you know, lower end of the distribution, improving things, it would, there would be less people here. Um, <laughs> I'm sure at least some people were hoping there was more interest to kinky than just that, right? I don't know. Okay. So, <clears throat> so now. <clears throat> what, I, what I have done in a paper, and I could spend 30 minutes and go through all the gory details, but I'm going to tell you what the outcome is. I'm going to tell you that this outcome is kind of robust to however you would do it, and then you can trust me, or you can go read the paper. <laughs> okay? Which is basically... Uh, <clears throat> here's the empirical kind of exercise that I do, is I say, let's take an index of national development where I take, and I don't have a good indicator for social equality, so I take bureaucratic capability, a measure of democracy, and a measure of GDP per capita, and I combine them into a simplest possible index, and I have an index of national development, and then I say, how does that index of national development correspond with national aggregate levels of indicators of human development. And then these are bar charts that sort of show you among the poor countries of the world, um, on a scale of 0 to 100, where 100 is the highest country in the sample and 0 uh, is the lowest, right? Um, among the poor countries, the kind of range is about 16 to 34. Among the lower middle income countries, it goes 39 to 60. It goes 54 to 72 among the third quartile. And for the richest countries, it goes 74 to, 100, to 90. So meaning, <clears throat> this is an expression of drive. Countries, as they move from this level of national development to this level of national development to this level of national development, have about that much improvement in this indicator of human development. Right? So you can imagine, and there's all kinds of assumptions being packed into this, that if we causally were to able to attain national development, we would get about that much improvement in human development. And that would be our drive gain. But it's also clear that there's some shift gain. Some countries, even at roughly the same level of national development, have much better health outcomes and some have much worse health outcomes. So it's also possible that we could get some gain with shift. Right? So shift strategies would sort of move you from being underperforming in this dimension for your level of national development to improving better. And then we could also imagine kink, where for any given country, a country that it was this average level of education would have some people with less and some people with more. And so we can imagine improving the situation in this country by bringing everybody up to this threshold. So in education, for instance, we could have a kinky goal like universal primary completion, where through the distribution of all educational outcomes, we've drawn some specific low bar threshold of completion of primary and said, it's really important that people get up to that level, but we kind of don't care higher, which is kind of a kinky thing to say, because it's like not at all clear why we really care of getting you fifth to sixth, but don't care at all about getting you sixth to seventh, but that's what the goal says. That's what the MDG says, right? The MDG says, we really care about universal primary completion. And doesn't say anything else about the average level, about the upside level, um, and we'll come back to other things it doesn't say. So then you ask yourself the question, empirically for education and health, how much of development progress is drive, shift, and kink? Right? Kind of what would be the kind of important elements of drive, shift, and kink? Well, Kind of no matter how you do it, we do a simulation exercise, and <clears throat> I'm waving my hands because I'm an economist, and that's what we do. It's like, and I'm waving both hands, not just one hand. So there's a lot of magic that goes in there. And then, woof, there's this rabbit that pops out. And here's what the rabbit says. <clears throat> and the rabbit kind of has to say this, but 
The first thing is that kink, as a low bar MDG, does nothing for nearly anyone. By construction. Why? <laughs> because if you draw a low bar, few people are below it. So if you draw an international low bar through education and say universal primary completion, then most countries have already got universal primary completion. So kinky doesn't have anything to do with them, right? Second, kinky is almost completely irrelevant for most developing countries. So if we say the, the kink, the, the problem being that if we go back and say, we've set the kinky level to reach the average level of the poorest countries, nearly all of the poorest countries are way, way above that. These are still developing countries. I mean, these are countries like India, right? But they're already way above what could plausibly be a kinky low bar goal. Same thing here. Kinky low bar goal has almost nobody in the next quartile higher of national development in it. So by construction, low bar kinky goals become irrelevant for countries. They just stop really having any traction because very few people in those countries are affected by the kink, are below the kink. Right? And that's just a necessary consequence of kink. Third, <clears throat> drive is the only way to get countries above any high bar international standard. So if we chose, as a development target, that countries have the same level of education as the Czech Republic. Right? We're in the Czech Republic, your education's pretty decent, right? You're here in university, you kind of, you survived. <laughs> at least it's lots of years of schooling to get here, right? Let's say, let's say we said, okay, as a target, we want countries just to get to the Czech Republic. Not countries higher than the Czech Republic, just to the Czech Republic, right? Well, then look back at this chart. Well, the Czech Republic's actually going to be up here, which is it's going to be in the lower part of the richest countries, and no country down here is at that level. There's, there, there's nobody down here at these levels of national development getting to the Czech level of education. So if we set an international target that would be like a cosmopolitan goal that kind of everybody in the world should kind of have aspirations to achieve, not like the US level, forget the US, just Czech Republic levels, there's the only way to get there is drive. Full stop. There's no evidence that shift or kink Kink can't get you there anywhere near, and there's no evidence that shift has enough bite to it to really get you to reasonable looking high level targets, right? <clears throat> Fourth, drive eventually works always. Meaning, <laughs> if you get national development, you will get every level of human development you want. Just full stop. Meaning, <laughs> there just are no countries up here on national development. This is the low, this is the worst of the richest court of the, and I, I'm being sloppy. This is a national development index that has three components. It's not GDP per capita. I'm not defending GDP per capita except as a component of this. But this is the worst of the poor countries. You just don't get to be at this level of national development and still have child mortality just doesn't happen. And on nearly every indicator of human development, the same is true. You just don't get to high levels of, of national development and still have human development problems of the type that these countries routinely experience. So drive always works. <laughs> Finally, shift is also possible and more in some domains than other. So I'm not, my, my main bone to pick is how much of development effort should be about kink and how much of development effort should be about drive. And I'm like a 90, I'm like an 85, 10, 5 kind of guy. 85% of it should be focused on drive, about 10% should be focused on shift, and about 5% should be focused on kink. The world is moving, the MDGs were 100% kinky. They were just kinky. There was no discussion of anything above low bar targets. 
Once you completed primary school, you were done. Once you were above poverty, there was no mention of having a goal that people would get richer than dollar a day poverty. Right? There was no mention <laughs> of, like, if your father had a heart attack, maybe somebody would do something to help him survive. If he didn't get affected by one of the named MDG diseases, they had nothing to do with him. If your mother got cancer, too bad for her, wasn't in the MDG list. <laughs> Am I making anybody angry yet? <laughs> <clears throat> so, so, kind of where we got, <laughs> I, I can see when I turn my back. Okay, anybody angry yet? I'm going to turn my back and you can raise your hands. Okay, I'm turning back around. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing is, is that we very much headed um, towards a set of development goals that didn't have any developing countries in them. What I mean by that? What I mean by that is take the dollar a day poverty line and then look at the 40th percentile. That is a person who is poorer than the median person. The median person's at the 50th percentile. So look at a person who's in the poorest half, but kind of just below the median, and ask, is that person poor by a dollar a day standard? And the 20 largest developing countries in the world. In 16 of the 20 largest developing countries of the world, countries with 4.2 billion people, the 40th percentile is above dollar a day, which means not just the upper middle class, but the middle class are completely excluded by a dollar a day poverty target in places like India. <coughs> and only four of them, these four, Nigeria, Bangladesh, the DRC, and Tanzania, have even the 40th percentile below the poverty line. And only two of them have the median, the typical person, um, below the dollar a day poverty line. So basically, the country, if you had people vote their interest, you would, and say, do we want an agenda in which you're included or you're not included? The median voter wouldn't vote for a dollar a day poverty standard in countries with 4.2 billion people. Like, that's most of the world's population. So we've now defined a low bar development target that doesn't have any developing country people, doesn't have very many developing country people in it. <clears throat> okay. So, now I'm to my second message. Now, if these low bar targets are so completely, like, outrageous and irrelevant, why are they so popular, right? So, <clears throat> why is, um, why is kinky development so seductive to the rest, even when it's irrelevant to the rest, right? Even when it's irrelevant to Indonesia and India, um, it still is more, it's getting more and more love in the West. And I think there's three reasons for this. Um, one, advocates for specific programs love it, because um, they love, uh, second, strangely, these two form a very strange love affair because fiscal cost cutters love it too. And I'll get back to that. And then third, um, the rich country has developed a large strand of what people call post-materialism, which are people that no longer believe that material progress is really that important. And hence, when post-materials project their reality onto other people, they think those other people should also have post-material goals. And they don't. They have material goals. But it's seductive to think the rest of the world shares your goals given your circumstances. So first, um, the kinky agenda has been very um, seductive because it seems so easy. You know, generating a more productive economy, well, that's hard. Better polity and like actual political struggles over the control of power, that's really hard. Capable administration so that, you know, policemen actually police and aren't corrupt, that's really hard. We don't know how to do that. Cohesive societies, such that gender, race, ethnicity, religion don't play a large role, that's really hard. All of this is really hard. So let's do this stuff. Let's do stuff where we can reduce the problem to a fundable logistical program, right? I can build a school. 
<laughs> and I know I can build a school because I can cocoon the hell out of my project so that the government doesn't touch it. I can contract it out to a foreign NGO, and by God, I can build a school. And by God, I can put some butts in seats. I can put some kids in that school. And then if I've defined development as putting kids in school, woohoo, I've succeeded. Right? So it gives you tractable success, even in environments in which you're failing at all this other stuff. And so it becomes very seductive to, oh, well, we can at least do this. Right? Um, the second thing, uh, <clears throat> now the, the second thing, and this is the politics of strange bedfellows, is that you know, if you're a rich country now, you've kind of had a major financial crisis and you've got a huge deficit. You've got Europe and the United States and Japan have had very dim growth prospects. And by the way, you've got, I mean, this is most, so if we, <laughs> if we look at this audience mostly from here back, you guys have a big problem. And you know what it is? <laughs> it's all, it, 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 <laughs> you've got a demographic problem, which you guys have to fund these guys' pensions. Right? That problem in Europe is getting fantastically worse and is going to constrain the fist of every country. You guys turned around. You're supposed to stay that way. <laughs> so you have a demographic fiscal crisis looming because there just aren't enough of you young guys to pay for us old guys. And I'm not European, so I don't have to. But So the thing is, if you only have a small amount of resources, how should you define development? You should define it in such a way that with a small amount of resources, you can make traction on it. You know, why say I'm going to struggle with the problem of Indian becoming a state as capable as Czech Republic from its very chaotic and misordered and dysfunctional current state when I can just carve off some narrow goals that if I pump some money into it, it'll be OK, right? So actually, the advocates and the fiscal cutters kind of form this weird coalition in which the fiscal guys want to give development less, right? And the advocates say, we'll take less if we can target it narrower. OK. The last thing <clears throat> is that there's a world value survey that goes out and asks people about their priorities on various things from which the data about support for aid come. Those data, I'm sure, are from the world value survey. But they ask people their priorities for their country. And they have various options. And they classify those options into the scale of whether your priorities for your country are mainly materialist, like rapid, more rapid economic growth, or are mainly post-materialist, like, and there are lots of different things of this type. It isn't those two exact questions, like more beautiful cities. right? Now, <coughs> then. I look at the ratio of how many people in the country are materialists for every post-materialist. So how many people want kind of more economic growth and more material stuff for people that want more beauty and poetry and stuff? And not surprisingly, in Sweden, people want lots more poetry. Why? Because they got, ch sorry, uh, I was going to use a swear word. Um, they got crap loads of stuff, right? Swedes have lots of stuff. So if you say, at the margin, do you want more stuff or do you want more beautiful cities? They'll say beautiful cities. Do you want more stuff or do you want more poetry? Yeah, poetry. I wouldn't mind a little poetry because I don't consume any now and I got lots of stuff. So poetry, right? Whereas if in countries that don't have a lot of stuff, you ask this question, they go, stuff, stuff. We want stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> in Rwanda, there's six materialists for every post-materialist. In Sweden, there's two post-materialists for every materialist. They're kind of really anti-stuff. Um, in Egypt, there's 60 materialists for every post-materialist. And Egypt's kind of a middle of the middle of their own national development country. They're not super underdeveloped, right? So the difficulty is is um, <coughs> is that post-materialists. Uh, are really important to the aid agenda. And they like the aid agenda to look post-materialist. And they don't like hearing so much about building large dams. So post-materialists kind of, oh, large dams, they hurt some fish. And oh, let me turn my light on and read more about why dams are terrible. Right? So the post-materialists 
can easily project onto others their own material circumstances and conclude that others would be better off with more post-material progress rather than material progress. Whereas when people ask their own opinion given the material progress, say, stuff. We'd really like more stuff. OK. But, you know, <laughs> the socket ball and the, and the, and the you know, all kinds of little kind of uh, essentially trivial ways around the lack of stuff are much more popular because they don't come with all the loaded consequences and the necessary sacrifices to produce stuff. OK, so um, kinky, now the third question is why am I against kinky, right? And I want to emphasize, I'm not against kinky, right? I'm all for kinky. It's just kinky is not reproductive. So if you want to have babies, you can't just do the kinky, right? So if you really want to do the productive stuff, you've got to put more emphasis on the old-fashioned, like, reproductive stuff and a little less emphasis on the kinky. So I'm not against kinky, right? I'm just against a, an agenda dominated by kinky. Okay, so what's, the, but why am I against kinky? First of all, it contrasts the agenda in the West with what the West really want, right? National development agenda is the develop, is the, by and large, the agenda of developing country governments. What developing country governments want is they want national development defined in the old fashioned way as higher levels of productivity of their economy, higher levels of capability of their state, a little bit more <laughs> participation of the polity for some of them, not so much for others of them, um, and a little bit more social equality. And they've just now formed a brand new development bank because they felt the existing development institutions were not responsive to what they wanted. They wanted national development, and they got instead kinky. So it, it actually, it, it's eroding the overall na international coalition for development. Third, it erodes middle class support for effective public action. So if in a country like India you want to do stuff, <coughs> you've got to do shift and drive as well as kink. You can't just do kink. It's a democracy. And they vote. And if you say, I'm going to have a national agenda that benefits 23% of the people, guess what? <laughs> You're not going to get 51% of the vote. Um, The third reason kinky is dangerous is that kinky, in the interests of its beautiful, beautiful, and important PR attractiveness, and I will grant you the PR attractiveness of this stuff. That's why it's seductive, right? It is seductive, right? I mean, he might not have been seduced by it, but he recognizes that it seduces others, right? That's what he means by communications. Um, <clears throat> uh, you know, that it often misses the point. So the MDG for schooling was the goal of universal completion of a full course of primary schooling. And amazing progress got made on that. But the problem was, if you ask yourself in the world today, <clears throat> where, <laughs> how did most of the uneducated, meaning lacking in education, meaning lacking basic skills, how did most of the uneducated come to be uneducated? They came to be uneducated by going to school. Most of the uneducated in the world are in school and going to school. So if you look at even a super poor country like Malawi and take all children at the age of sixth grade and say, are you functionally numerate? Do you have the basic, basic, basic? This is not like a, a, a high school exam in Czech Republic. This is like literally two digit edition. Right? Are they functionally numerate? Right? Well, 4% of kids, and Malawi is a terribly, terribly poor place, 4% of the kids never went to school. 13% right? of the kids went to school but dropped out before sixth grade. And 50% of the kids went to fifth grade and ended up functionally enumerate. So if we say, who are the uneducated? The uneducated is this group, which is dominated by kids who went to six years of schooling who completed the MDG. How did that happen? Oh, shoot. We forgot to say anything about actually learning anything in school. We just had a goal that said you had to stay there, right? 
Well, unfortunately, the only other social process we measure with time served <laughs> is not a very popular one. So my conclusion, the MDGs were a very successful attempt to define development down and supplant a national development agenda with a low bar specific domain narrow targets. The debate now in 2015 is between an international elite who want a continuation of the low bar targets and the middle income countries who have grown out of low bar targets and want national development to continue their drive to a decent standard of living. And broader goals are now on the agenda instead of focus, and I am all for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bridget. And now I would like to uh, introduce to you Mr. Michal Kaplan, who has been listening to the lecture <laughs> with us, who is the head of the Czech Development Agency and who has accepted our invitation to become a discussant to Mr. Bridget. So please, can you move forward? Thank you. And I would like to uh, open the floor now for discussion. You have heard many, many remarks and many comments on, on the development. So please, if you have any questions, uh, raise up your hands and we will bring the microphone to you. But before that, let me please pass the word to Mr. Kaplan to begin. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I have a very difficult role you know, <laughs> to, to respond to the professor's uh, lecture and to launch uh, discussion. Uh, first, uh, let me say that I believe that MDGs have been a success. But I agree that uh, they have been more successful as a PR tool in, its, in their simplicity to, to, co to communicate to the general public. They have been less successful as a, as a guide for practical policy. I don't know of any developing country that would you know, copy-paste MDGs as, as the base of their national development strategy. Of course, that they have reported on MDGs, but if you look into the national development strategies of uh, poor countries, they have uh, set themselves uh, other targets, maybe more ambitious targets uh, and, and more, more, uh, more complex targets. So what's wrong with the MDGs? Uh, I agree that uh, one flaw is that they measure quantity rather than quality. Let's take the education goal, uh, which means the number of uh, children who attend schools. It's fine, but uh, attending uh, a school doesn't, uh, you know, tell much about, uh, you know, uh, learning results. So we have we have other measures, for example, the OECD PISA, uh, you know, uh, ranking of uh, uh, educational results. So this this is one one problem with MDGs. And the other problem is is exactly with the income MDGs because uh, it is defined as a threshold. Which, uh, which you know, narrows down the focus uh, of uh, development community just on, on this $1.25 uh, dollars per day, and it is a very narrow, narrow view. But I would not agree that uh, uh, this, this, this goal was not relevant. You know, at the time the goal was established in 1990, there were two, two billion people living on one dollar or less. So I think that the goal was relevant. And it was ambitious enough uh, 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 as well, because now we see that by 2015, uh, the number of people uh, living on uh, less than one dollar per day will be halved, more or, more or less, thanks to China and India. If you exclude China and India, uh, the, the target would not, been, would not been met. So I think the ambition was uh, right. But the problem was that uh, uh, it, 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 it was uh, a narrow focus on just uh, the poorest part of the population. So, uh, Professor, uh, uh, you know, uh, talked about the income distribution. So, if you look uh, on the population as as, as a whole, you, you, what what do you, what, what do you what do you find? You find that the poverty has decreased, but the inequality has increased. Uh, it's tr it's strange, but the, the poorest people have improved their situation, and I think that some credit uh, needs to be you know accredited to, to the MDGs. The richest people, and especially the richest of the richest people, have uh, improved their situation even more. 
and the middle class, the people in the middle, they, uh, they are being squeezed out and they are feeling uh, you know, uh, a stress. So I think it's very important uh, to introduce a new statistics, uh, not only the 1.25 threshold, but to look on the median income. And a median income is a very good measure because uh, not only for uh, economic reasons, but also for political reasons, because it's just in the middle of the population. And uh, in, in a democratic uh, system, you can't win elections without winning the vote of the median voter. So it's a very important uh, measure. Uh, and uh, after the Second World War, you know, the, if, if you follow the, the gro economic growth, uh, it was five, six uh, percent a year. But the income of medium, uh, you know, uh, income, income of medium uh, uh, people have, you know, had increased by the same amount, five or six percent a year. So it was a, a fair, a fair society. But this pattern has changed, you know, at the beginning of 70s and uh, in the 80s and, and, and now there is a spread, uh, you know, the, e the economy, the productivity of economy is still, you know, uh, growing, but the, 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 the income of the, you know, medium uh, worker uh, is, 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 is lagging behind. So, so I think this is the problem. There are many explanations for that. Uh, technological change, for example, now everybody is talking about the third wave of industrial revolution. The, the machines are once again replacing uh, workers. Uh, maybe it's a, a temporary uh, feature and uh, the technological change will uh, gradually you know, uh, create benefits for the whole population. But the second explanation for this uh, disparity between you know, productivity of the economy as such and the, 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 the middle class uh, uh, wealth is that perhaps democracy is not working uh, well. Uh, the, the rules of the game has, uh, have, have been changed and the, the, the elite, you know, the, has, uh, and through, through lobbying, lobbying the, the, po the, the, the policy makers and decision makers, they have distorted the, the, the rules of the game. Uh, so this is my this is my analysis. I will turn uh, now to the to the to, to the uh, development policy because I am a practitioner. I uh, I had the agency Czech Development Agency who provides uh, uh, development cooperation to, to to poor countries. So so in my view there are two basic strategies how we should uh, uh, reduce uh, poverty and these strategies uh, loosely loosely uh, correspond to the professor's. Uh, uh, drive versus king approach. So the, the, the drive approach I call a capi capitalistic strategy, which is a very optimistic you know, strategy that uh, uh, you know, innovation, entrepreneurship uh, is good and that uh, uh, inequality as such is not a problem. Uh, rich people are getting richer, but these rich people spend uh, you know, uh, on, on goods and services provided by, uh, by uh, not so rich people and poor people. So as far as this uh, wealth you know, flows down uh, to, to the population, the trickle down you know, economy, uh, it's fine. So this is the capitalistic strategy. And the second uh, is I call a socialist strategy, which tries to target the poor directly, of, often through redistribution, redistribution of, of wealth. Uh, I come from a country, you know, uh, Czech Republic and Czechoslovakia, uh, who had this experience with communism. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm against against uh, this uh, extreme version of uh, of, uh, of socialism. But still, you know, there are some uh, interesting and surprisingly interesting examples that this strategy could work. For example, in Brazil, uh, some of you may heard uh, about the Boza Boza Familia scheme which was uh, you know, targeted, very much targeted to the poor, uh, conditional cash transfers. So this was giving money to, to, to poor people in Brazil, but the, the distribution of money was conditional. For example, that the mothers uh, uh, had to get their children you know, uh, vaccinated and they had to send their children to school. So I think we should also think uh, about, about uh, this uh, this, uh, you know, uh, di direct, uh, you know, at attacking the poverty directive from, uh, from this point of view. Uh, I, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's it. So I will, I will now uh, uh, ask uh, or, or raise uh, three, three questions uh, uh, to, to the professor. 
because in your presentation you you presented these four elements of uh, national capability as as the basis uh, for driving you know the development of uh, of, of of countries uh, up, upwards. Uh, I was missing one element, and this was democracy, liberal democracy. Uh, do 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 you believe that uh, liberal democracy as a, as a model of organizing uh, society is the best model how to deliver? On, on development and, uh, and poverty reduction, especially now when there are some alternative uh, models uh, like the China model mm. or Turkey. Turkey is also a successful country in terms of uh, economic development, but uh, we cannot call Turkey a uh, liberal, liberal democracy uh, as yet. So this is my first uh, question. The second question uh, is about donor interventions, because uh, uh, sometimes we mix two things, you know, uh, development strategies of uh, poor countries, because the governments of poor countries are responsible for their development in the first place. And then, you know, donor intervention, you know. Uh, this, uh, this should be, I think, uh, uh, distinguished. It's in, I agree that the governments of poor countries need to focus on the whole of the population, not only just the poorest of the poor, uh, but uh, donor agencies, on the other hand, they don't feel this kind of constraint. Uh, and if you ask uh, people in the Czech Republic whether Czech aid should go, you know, to the poorest of the poor, they, they, they say yes. Uh, I think that the, the role of the Czech aid or Czech taxpayer is not to, to, try, to, uh, in, to, to try to provide hot shower for the, for the you know, uh, middle, middle guy in Brazil or Indonesia. So, uh, so uh, do, do, would you agree that even though, you know, Governments in partner countries need to focus on the uh, on the population as a whole. Uh, the special the special added value of uh, donor intervention should still be to focus on the on the poorest uh, part of the population in in, in, in in these countries. And and the third question is uh, uh, particularly important for the Czech, Czech Republic as a donor, because uh, uh, I think that uh, what we try to do in our aid sometimes we also. Uh, are seduced by these, uh, you know, easy solutions and, and kinky development, but sometimes, uh, sometimes not. And uh, for example, we try to support uh, good governance in our partner countries, uh, uh, justice reform in our partner countries, decentralization, you know, and all this kind of uh, institutional building. And I think this is the hard way how, how to how to achieve uh, development. But it's the in the long run, it's is is the is the, is the is the most effective way. So. Do you think that the Czech uh, development aid is on the on the good path? You know, uh, you know, trying to uh, to target this kind of intervention. Thank you. So A, let me just answer the three questions really quickly, and then we'll get on to questions from the audience. First of all, in my four things, and I'm just going back through this in an irritating way, but I call this a responsive polity. Some might believe liberal democracy is a necessary condition of responsive polity. I don't. I, I, I am agnostic about how one achieves a responsive polity. I mean, liberal democracy has been one way that it's happened. But if you have other ways of achieving, the, the sovereign is tightly constrained by the wishes of the citizens aggregated in a reasonable way, I don't see any reason why we should, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of liberal democracy, but I'm not like an exclusive fan of liberal democracy. I'll watch other people play soccer too. I mean, you know, so, uh, so, but I, you know, but that said, in order to have a responsive polity, lots of the things that are compatible with little liberal democracy, like respecting human rights, like a free press, like transparency of government, are necessary for a responsive polity as well. So, um, uh, the, the second question was kind of Czech voters want it to go to the poorest of the poor. I, I think that that is partly a consequence of the preaching of kinky development, and you could easily change that. I don't think that's fixed in stone, because after all, relative to Czech standards, even $5 a day are the poorest of the poor. So, you know, had we constructed a $5 a day poverty standard, whereas the, the, Euro, the European poverty standard is usually like $30 a day, 
had we constructed a $5 a day standard, could we not have convinced the world that was the poorest of the poor? Yeah, I think we could have. So dollar a day, I think it's a social construct. It's a fiction that could be blown away in a heartbeat and replaced with something else with a little bit better communications. I don't think that's constrained. Um, third, I think, you know, I agree when the Czech development, you want to have a portfolio of doing some of the kinky, but some of the hard. And I think it's hard to get right how much of the hard. But you can't just ignore the hard. Because the problem is, is it's, it's not just these are complementary strategies. Sometimes doing the kinky actually undermines progress on the hard, right? You're doing things that allow governments to persist and not improve what they're doing by taking pressure off them in some ways. Whereas working together with them, and I agree, national governments have to lead this, but the problem is the world is getting such that national governments, when, even when they set out perfectly reasonable development strategies, don't feel the international development community is there to support them on the hard things like decentralization, like good governance reforms, because they come in and say, well, good governance has to be about the poorest, because we're conflating the poverty objectives and the other development objectives. And then you say, well, how would this governance reform benefit the poorest? I don't know, but maybe what if it benefits everybody? Is that such a terrible thing? And I think national governments are increasingly feeling stranded that the development community is not there to help them on the hard things without this additional overlaid targeting focus. So it's kind of keeping the kinky even overlapping the hard is, 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 has been a destructive influence, I feel, of the kinky. Okay, thank you. So we have the first question here. Thank you, for, Professor, for an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, if you look at it from a, a policymaker's point of view, there, there was and there is, still is the need to communicate in a simple fashion in order to get support for more funds to be put into uh, um, uh, providing development aid to third mm -hmm. countries. So one of the biggest problems is how do you convince the uh, average person that we have to, uh, we have to, we should uh, give more funds for third countries? And of course, the real world is very complex, but you have to um, describe it in simple ways in order to be able to uh, have support from uh, the people in the street that are not knowledgeable in the particular topic. And of course, a number of factors influence whether or not what we're doing is successful. Look at Ebola. I mean, uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and uh, Liberia, we could have done the perfect projects there. But because of Ebola, now we don't have the results that we expected. So the world is very, very complex. But if we look at the future, if we look at what's happening now, one of the biggest challenges is inequality. Not inequality, inequality only in developing countries, but inequality in developed countries. The, the post-2015 um, uh, indicators, which are currently at 17 goals and something like 170 um, mm -hmm. indicators, basically will be applicable to all countries. They will not be just applicable to the developing countries, but throughout the world. What would you suggest for, uh, um, and how feasible is it to to expect that there will be some other type of logic applied to these goals. If we know, for example, that uh, if you're born in the lowest 20% in the US, you have a 95% possibility of uh, remaining in the lowest, poorest 20% in the US, as le at least that's some figures that I've seen, or in, or in countries in Europe or elsewhere, we're seeing inequality rise. So what would you suggest? How can you convince policymakers which generally intend to do good, to go for some other types of uh, goals, to go for a drive, and uh, with what amounts of money are we talking about to be able to achieve what you are suggesting? And just a comment on the slide on Malawi that you uh, showed. Um, do you have figures of how much of the uh, illiterate in Malawi were, uh, were in school before say 2000 and after 2000 now there is a part of the illiterate that are at school as far as what you said but before that before the time of the uh, MDGs would you have the same problem which is now reduced or uh, or re 
point has remained uh, the same. Thank you. Should we take multiple? Why don't we take a round, if you don't mind, because we've got a half an hour left in the room? Or? Let's take multiple questions and then. Do you mind if I take other questions and then come back? Okay. Were there other questions? That guy back there, he was, seemed really desperate earlier. That's why I was getting to him. Uh, Professor Pritchett, thank you very much. <clears throat> I find your concept perfectly consistent, to be honest. And if I understand you correctly, you face a refusal, lack of understanding, ignorance from um, the side of the post-materialist elite of the elites. If, if I understand correctly, this is what you said, actually, or this is what you expressed. Do you believe, this is my question now, do you believe there is a sort of refusal, ignorance, and lack of understanding also on the side of the recipient countries, or recipient so societies, actually. Thank you. OK, there are, are there some more questions? Petra uh, Labra, Glopolis. I, uh, thank you very much for a very uh, interesting and indeed provocative lecture. Um, also find many of uh, the things you said I mean, fitting, uh, uh, fitting the bigger picture of, of the development. It's really important to open debates in this way. I especially liked your uh, definition of reason why, uh, why the kinky development is so seductive. I mean, the combination of the fiscal cost cutters specific program uh, advocates and the post-materialists in which I count myself as well is really, is really very, uh, I think, um, uh, elucidating and showing way forward. We've been discussing with the NGO community really how to how to get uh, outside of this our silo uh, of the post-materialist. I would still uh, doubt that it goes, you know, across the uh, across the countries, all the countries that you name, like the Chile, for instance, was an interesting example. Yeah. I would say Bhutan and other countries would pro also probably qualify for different ratio of the, you know, post-materialist materialist. materialist um, so it's much. Uh, it's also a question of culture, not just uh, not just uh, income, definitely. But the question, what I'm, what I really, uh, what I'm really missing in your, in your, even uh, the the very basic four uh, four main model is the environmental uh, limits. Mike, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. It was a bit running off. Um, the batteries probably. Uh, is, is, it, is it something that actually limits the possibilities of the good, you know, old-fashioned uh, national development? Because that's what I understand mm -hmm. that you are advocating for, in fact, that we should give uh, developing countries free hands to develop mm -hmm. the way we have. And that's, that's probably quite... My question is, do we have the space, you know, for this? I mean, given... We're approaching... Uh, the, the dangerous limits in, in CO2 emissions, etc. I mean, we'll have these discussions all next year alongside the SDG debates uh, with, the, with the COP21 approaching. Uh, that's one. And the other, the other question that I have is then what would, be your, uh, what would be your vision for the development of those above the line? So, okay, if we, if we and I very much agree with Michal that we need to basically focus not on the uh, low bar, but, but much more work with the middle class, medium income type of indicators, uh, so, what would be your recommendations for us in the in the north here? I mean, shall we go most more, more post-material, or shall we al also follow the good old, you know, uh, drive kind of uh, development? Because I think there's also still a lot of people who want stuff. You know, I mean, it's, I mean, I also want stuff, and that's 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 fine. So we'll probably go 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 this way. Or, you know, is there any other vision on on your side for for the north? Thank you. Okay, let me, let, me take those, let me take that set and then come back and I'm gonna kind of go up in reverse order. So first of all, I, I think if we adopted something like progress of the median person, I would be terrifically in favor of that. I work with Center for Global Development where Nancy Birdsall, the head of it, has a slogan, the median is the message. <laughs> so, you know, let's just focus on the median. Um, 
the point being, in you know, 18 of the 20 largest developing countries in the world, the median is already above a dollar a day. So if we focus on the median, we're already giving up on dollar a day and moving to higher standards and moving to relative standards, and I'm all for that. So if we focus on the median, um, I'm happy with that. I have other suggestions on all the other components. Um, so for instance, moving to a more kind of broad, a, a learning-based and broader definition of education goals, I think it'd be terrific. But So I, I don't think it's impossible, and, and uh, moreover, you know, I'm not against low bar, I'm against exclusively low bar. So my proposal is let's have a low bar and let's have an ideal and let's define development as reaching the ideal and part of, so it's, it's you know, it's both as opposed to the MDGs which were exclusively low bar. There was no ideal expressed. It was this, they're confusing. Uh, in my view, the MDGs always confused. Um, the MDGs are what will happen when development has happened. That doesn't mean if the MDGs have happened, we have reached development, right? Because if you reach development through drive, shift, and kink, you will have solved all the low bar problems. And you know, in particular, you can't attribute any of the poverty reduction in China to the MDGs. Like, come on, let's be serious. The Chinese did not do anything they did because they got, oh my gosh, the world has a goal of reducing dollar a day poverty. Right? So since most of the poverty reduction came through the Chinese, the MD, you know, what was actually achieved on dollar a day poverty and the MDGs is completely causally unconnected. Right? So anyway, so I think there are a set of goals, but moreover you could have low bar goals and ideals in the same document, which is sort of where we've had it. Let me come back to that. Okay. Um, with the post-materialists, I think the post-materialists and all of us just need to get the golden rule right. Right? What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself, which is both Jesus and Kant, so we're covered on all ends, right? Um, <laughs> uh, Kant used to teach right by here, didn't he? Wasn't Kant from, anyway. Okay, Immanuel Kant. Everybody remember Immanuel Kant? Anyway. He was a German. He was a German, but it's close. Yeah, well, I mean, he wasn't, <laughs> he wasn't Buddha or anything. He wasn't from Nepal. Anyway, okay. But the point is, when you say the golden rule is do unto others as you would have done unto you, you don't mean as I would have done unto me in my circumstances. You mean as I would have done unto me in your circumstances. So, you know, when the environmental NGOs decide to oppose large dams because they want more untrammeled, you know, the Vermont guy, he's, his staffer is just obsessed with fish. And so he wants untrammeled river courses for fish and so is against dams. And like, yeah, if I had all the electricity I had coming down from Hydro Quebec, I would piss on dams for you know Africans anyway. Let's have fish in Africa, and I'll have electricity in Vermont. But that's not the golden rule. The golden rule is doing unto others as they want in their circumstances. And if they want material stuff, we should want for them material stuff independent of what we want in our circumstances. And I think in the NGO community, getting that a little writer and a little more explicit, I think would help a ton. On this environmental limits thing, it's really hard because 20 years ago, I could give you a really firm answer, and I can't today. So here's the answer I would have given 20 years ago that I'm not giving today, but I would have given 20 years ago, and I'm saying I'm not giving it today so no one Twitters. Can everyone stop Twittering for a second? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Since the type, uh, time of Malthus, people said there were environmental limits to growth, and they were wrong. They were just wrong. It was just lack of imagination, lack of foresight, lack of understanding of economics. It was just bullshit. It was just wrong, okay? So every time anybody said there were limits to growth because of the environment, they were wrong. And up until 20 years ago, that was still true, right? So one of the famous economists in America once said the population of New York City couldn't get above three million people. That was the upper limit of the growth you could have in New York City. Why? Because he was writing in 1898. And what was the key constraint on the growth of New York City? Horse manure. Horse manure. Because after all, you could do the calculation, and each person required so much stuff to come in onto this island of Manhattan and off this island of Manhattan. 
And to do that, you could calculate the horsepower you needed to get that stuff in, and you could calculate the horse poop per horsepower ratio, and you could calculate the vol volume of horse poop, and you said, we can't have more than three million people on a Ma Manhattan because there'll be too much horse poop. And kind of, if nobody had invented the automobile, he might have been right. But somebody did invent the automobile, and all of a sudden these environmental limit calculations were just bogus because it was all presuming existing technology. So Malthus was wrong. Every Malthusian from Malthus was wrong. You know, there's probably been 19 things proposed as the environmental limits to growth. They've all been wrong. 20 years ago, that's what I would have said. Climate change. I don't know. We're screwed. Um, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> but, what? But, but I don't know how to cope with it. I, I, I just emotively, emotionally, I just don't know what to do. Because if you say to me, you know, I'm going to continue to live roughly the standard of the Czech Republic, but by God, Indians can't have refrigerators because it would blow climate change targets, I just can't wrap my head around that. That's just global injustice on a scale I just can't bring myself to embrace. But if you say, you know, we're just going to let India grow on exactly the in same energy consumption per capita GDP path as we did, it will, in fact, fry the planet. So I can't wrap my head around that anyway, so I don't know what to say now. It's like maybe the Malthusians are right for the first time in 300 years. And if they are, it, pro it you know, it just, it's this real obstacle in how we think about this. Um, and I, I just don't have any special insights into that, uh, other than I think it just it's global injustice of the first order to deny to other people what you have because they're na now getting it at the mark would create problems that you know nobody worried about you getting a refrigerator when you got yours because it would have fried the planet. So ah, sorry, I don't know what to say about that. Okay, um, are recipient countries sometimes ignorant? Obviously, of course they are, and sometimes leaders of re recipient countries want terrible things, right? But the beauty of the development endeavor is we should be able to match. When countries in these situations want to do good things, like have an effective municipal water corporation that would have 24-7 piped water, safe water to every house, we as the development community should be prepared to help them. So I'm not saying developing countries because they're poor are always right and rich countries are always wrong. I'm saying we shouldn't write the development agenda in such a way that we could be of help to a right-minded developing country. And yet we are doing that. We are, we do have countries coming to the international community with projects that are important to their countries they want to do and say, well, there's no money for that because it isn't in these bins that we've defined, right? So I'm not, I'm not naive that the world's full of corrupt dictators who would do terrible things, right? And moreover, they might not be right about the trade-offs. But on the other hand, I much more trust that they're going to be right about the trade-offs for them than I am going to be right about the trade-offs for them. I mean, guessing what it is they want is going to be hard for us. OK, which brings me to these like two important questions. right? One is, let's be clear right, about this equality thing. And there's two things that I think we should keep in mind. right? One is that <clears throat> the poor in rich countries are enormously better off in every material indicator of well-being than the rich in poor countries. I'm saying material. I'm just saying the, the main locus of inequality in the world is where you were born. If you want to say, I want to predict your level of well-being on any dimension, what do I have to ask? Are you men and women? Nah, that's not so important. Are you old or young? That's not so important. Rural, urban, not so important. What's important? Where you were born. If you were born in Denmark, boom, you're going to have high level well-being, even if you were born into a super poor household in Denmark, right? Or the United States, for that matter. I mean, you know, the, the richest quintile of African countries has higher child mortality than African Americans in Detroit. So take the least advantaged category in America, which are hugely screwed socially and economically and, and politically, and yet they still have levels of well-being in terms of school, in terms of education, in terms of water, in terms of everything, than even the prosperous people. So most of inequality is still cross-national. So if we say, let's focus on inequality within countries, I think it's almost a deliberate thing to avoid the major locus of inequality in the world by well-being. Okay. B, 
I'm for equality. It's the, 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 the only people talking about exclusive growth these days are the people that want it exclusively for the poor. That's exclusive growth. I'm for a middle class poor coalition. Right? Who is for the kinky coalition? The kinky coalition is the super rich with the poorest of the poor. Bill Gates is the kinky coalition. He doesn't give a shit about the middle class. Right? So but just don't kid yourself. The, what's going to provide progress in these countries on inequality is not focusing on the poor. It's the rich that are different. Now, if you want to sort of say, well, the problem with inequality is that the elites are gaming the political system, OK, are the poor defined by any low bar standard going to be the political coalition that stops that? No. It's going to be a middle class coalition that stops that together with the poor. So I'm the one that's against the elites, right? And what do I want? I want goals that benefit the middle class so that the middle class can be the politically and socially dominant and economically dominant part so that they can form a coalition with the poor to stop the abuses of the elites. Whereas a rich poor coalition is often how the extravagant inequalities at the top are perpetuated because they take enough of their income to give enough to the poor to keep the poor from forming a poor middle class coalition in favor of a rich poor coalition. And if you look at socialism, socialism was never about giving stuff to the poor. That's just wrong. Socialism was about giving stuff to everybody from a few. Right? So socialism is not about the poor. Socialism is about the middle class. And if you want socialism, you should be in favor of a middle class coalition. If you want a middle class coalition, you don't want kinky development, you want middle class targets. <laughs> you can respond, because you're right there an anxious to do so. <laughs> well, just a couple of comments. First of all, globally, the middle class is disappearing, is being squeezed, because you're getting... Uh, just uh, not true. Not true. Glo it depends on what you mean by the global middle class. I mean, you're saying country by country. Yes. But the thing is, you're taking a distribution here and a distribution. I mean, Denmark's here and India's here, and you're acting as if the middle class here and the middle class here means the same thing. Okay. I don't which, understand which that. Which leads Why me to my that? original question. Yeah. With such differences between countries, exactly. and keeping in mind that the, uh, the post-2015 goals will be global, Exactly. how can we arrive at some indicators which first can get agreed by everybody, and what could potentially be these indicators, uh, uh, practically? Because you have such uh, different uh, right. starting points. But, That's but my the thing is, we, the answer is we are going to arrive at a set of indicators that are going to be no use at all to John, Jan, right? Meaning, we are going to arrive, if we arrive at a set of indicators that the middle class of India and Indonesia will buy into, they're not going to be simple, they're not going to be few, they're not going to be kind of good for PR. And I'm, I'm super happy with that, because I just think we, you know, there's a question of how do we maintain the political wherewithal we need to have some amount of development effort, and then how do we define development? And I think we need to separate those two questions, such that in the post-2015 process about what development is, we're big, we're broad, we're inclusive in the way that it's headed, right? We already have 17 goals and 167 things. So the MDG era is already over, right? It's, it's done. So the eight MDGs, they're gone, right? In favor of 17, each with six, it's over, right? So I say good riddance. I thought, I thought they were a terrible thing in the first place, and I don't think any of the progress on the MDGs can be attributed to the MDGs anyway. Right. How much of the MDGs went down because it was an MDG, and how much do these things get better because countries did it? I don't think we have any evidence of that. And on the poverty one, it's obvious that it had nothing to do with it. Right? So <laughs> I think what we need to think about is your real question of once we have an agenda that the middle class of Indonesia can buy into, how do we create political support to support that agenda in the rich countries? But let's not get it backwards. Now, let's not look at rich country post-materialists and say, what would keep them happy, and then go try and sell it to the middle class of Indonesia. That's just completely backwards, and that's what we're doing today. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm really sorry.
sorry, but we ran out of the time. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'll need to stop it now, okay, and conclude the discussion. So, Len, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture and the discussion.